Well, good morning, Two Seasons. It's great to have you here. If you're watching online or if you're in Platinum, it's great to have you guys along as well. My name's Warwick, and it's my privilege to look at the Scriptures with you this morning. And I don't know if you can tell, but uh, I've been on holidays. Yep, we spent some time uh, right up in the northwest part of England, and let me just say, the scenery is absolutely spectacular. Man, a man, a man. We, we love exploring kind of out of the way places. And at one point, we found ourselves out in the middle of nowhere looking for an old railway viaduct. A viaduct is one of those humpy bridges that trains go across, across valleys and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, we ac- we're looking for this viaduct. We accidentally drove into somebody's driveway, not realising that the driveway was actually the old railway line. Now, we at this point looked a little bit sheepish, but the owner of the place who we found out his name was Graham, he was working in the garden and he poked his head out when he heard the car come in and invited us to come in and park and told us we were looking for the viaduct and he said, oh, look, it's actually just at the end of my garden. And uh, it's it's kind of cool, isn't it? That's a viaduct. Uh, His house is actually the old railway station. He reckoned he was the only family living in England that has a viaduct at the end of the garden. He and his wife have lived in this place uh, since the late 70s. And after we chatted with, uh, sorry, after we checked out the viaduct, we came back and have a lovely chat with Graham. And of course, Jesus came up. And as we spoke, Graham was absolutely emphatic. He said, There is nothing else. And he looked around and he said, This is heaven. And And looking around, in one sense, it was hard not to agree with him. The scenery was stunning. And it was England, and I have to say, the weather was perfect. And his wife, and he they lived in this exquisite location for about 40 years. In one sense, I could understand what he was saying. But in another, I couldn't. You see... We started talking about Jesus because Graham's wife was sitting there that afternoon in the sun and she could no longer eat and she only had days to live. As we walk away, the image that stuck in my mind was of Graham gently picking up this frail frame of a woman and placing her in her wheelchair so that he could take her inside. And as I walked away, I thought... The agony of death amongst such beauty, this this can't be heaven. There's got to be so much more. We, We might see glimpses, there might be hints, but if you and I think that this is heaven, we are aiming way too low and we really haven't understood anything about Jesus and what he comes to offer. You've joined us this morning uh, in the middle of a series called The Miracles of Jesus, a series where we look week in and week out, and we see Jesus giving us a glimpse of heaven as he reverses the problems that we all face as we live in a world that's been broken by sin. Today we're going to get a taste of heaven as we hear the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. We're going to get a glimpse of the banquet that is to come. The banquet when Jesus returns, when, when God dwells with his people and he feasts with us. How about we ask God this morning to help us to lift our eyes beyond this world and look for what is to come as he speaks to us through his word. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, speak to us. Lift our eyes beyond the day today. Help us to get a taste of what you promise. And help us to live now, really looking forward to then. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as I said, we are going to get a a taste of heaven. Here's an outline of uh, where we're going, and I want to begin by reminding us of the story. It's a simple story of Jesus feeding 5,000 men. We're going to be reading from Mark chapter 6, and we're going to pick it up at verse 7. 
We're going to start there because it's what happens before the miracle, before Jesus feeds this massive crowd that runs around the lake just to hear him. It's what happens before the miracle that sets the scene brilliantly. So what we're going to do is we're going to read verses 7 uh, to 13 and then skip to verse 30 and read to the end of the incident. And it goes like this. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, giving them authority over the unclean spirits. And he said to them, as you go on the journey, take nothing except your staff. No food, no bag, and no money for your belt. Just take the sandals that are on your feet and and don't take a second tunic. And whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave. But if anyone will not receive you and will not listen to you, when you depart... Shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And so the disciples went out and they began to preach that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and they anointed many who were sick with oil and healed them. Now, the disciples returned to Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said, come away. Let us go away together to a desolate place by ourselves and rest for a while. For there had been so many people coming and going that they'd not even had leisure to eat. And so they got in the boat and departed for a desolate place by themselves. But the people, many of the people, saw them leaving and recognized them and ran on foot from the villages and arrived there before them. And when Jesus came ashore, he saw a great crowd and he was filled with compassion. Compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Now, when it grew late, his disciples came and said to him, we're in a desolate place and the hour is is late. Send the people out into the countryside and the villages so that they can buy for themselves something to eat. But Jesus responded, he said, you, you give them something to eat. And the disciples said, shall shall we take 200 days pay so that we can go and buy food for them to eat? And Jesus responded, how many loaves of bread do you have? Go and see. And they found out and said, five plus two fish. So Jesus, he commanded all of the people to sit down in groups on the green grass, groups of hundreds and and groups of fifties. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes and he looked up to heaven and spoke a blessing. And then he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and they put it before the people. And he divided the fish among them all. And they all ate. And they were all satisfied. And they picked up 12 baskets of pieces of fish and bread. And the number who ate loaves was 5,000 men. That's the story. It's a simple story. It's a simple story of Jesus and his disciples working hard in ministry. Most of us at this time of the year, if we can, we like to take a holiday. How many of you are just about to take a holiday or have just had one like me? Quick show of hands. And then there's the rest, sorry. (laughs) Yep, okay. Uh, Jesus, he has his break interrupted by the enthusiasm of the crowd. He taught them till the end of the day, 
provides a meal miraculously, five loaves, two fishes, 12 baskets of leftovers. But as we read the story, did you notice that there are actually two miracles? It's easy to let the first one slip by without noticing it, but it really does give colour to the second. The account begins in chapter 6 and verse 7 with Jesus calling the 12 disciples and sending them out two by two and giving them authority over the unclean spirits, verse 12. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed many who were sick and healed them. And then we heard the report, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were calming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. They are all flat out. The 12 disciples and Jesus doing ministry, teaching, healing, casting out demons to the point where they haven't even had time for a feed themselves. Now just let that sink in for a moment. Can you see what is extraordinary about this scene? Can you see what goes beyond the normal? Over the last five chapters, we've grown used to Jesus doing extraordinary things. But did you notice that here, Jesus gives to the 12 the same power that he'd been exercising among the people? It's one thing to be able to do miracles, It's extraordinary to be able to give that power to others. It's one thing for God to enable someone to heal a person or to exercise power over demons. It's quite something different to be able to give that power to others. So let me ask you, what does this say about Jesus? That he can not only heal, but that he can empower his disciples to do the very same miracles. Miracles that really are reversing the effects of the fall. Reversing the effects of Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. Reversing the effects of God's curse on humanity for our rejection of his rule over us. What does this say about Jesus? The story that we're going to look at this morning is going to keep forcing us to ask that question again and again and again. Keep it rattling around in your mind as we keep moving forward. Keep it rattling around in your mind, especially if you're someone who does not yet follow Jesus. If that's you, ask yourself this. Who is this man? Who is this man? And do I need to reconsider my opinion of him? That's the first miracle. Did you notice the second miracle? And did you notice specifically that Jesus expected his disciples to do the miracle? Did you pick that up? Look at verse 35. And when it grew late, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. You do it. Now, they clearly don't have enough food with them. That's why they've come to Jesus to ask him to send them out so that they can fend for themselves. And it wasn't a case of poor planning. The 12 plus Jesus, they'd gone on a private holiday, just them. Jesus' words, you give them something to eat. You've just been healing the sick. You've just been teaching and casting out demons. You're exhausted from it. That's why we're here. You do it. But the disciples don't get it. Look at their response. They said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? That's 200 days wages. Six and a half months work. You want us to A, go out and find the money and B, spend it just so that we can give it to them to eat? Jesus' answer is, no, that's not what I asked you to do at all. I want you to give them something to eat. I want you to do the miracle. But they don't get it. And he said to them, verse 38, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Now, some people want to say that Jesus didn't really do a miracle. What he did here was he guilted the people into sharing. When the disciples went out to 
to have a look what was around. You know, they found a couple of people and they pulled out what they'd hidden and everybody else felt guilty so they pulled out what they'd hidden and then they shared. Let me just say the only people who suggest that are dumb Westerners who have never experienced Middle Eastern hospitality. Right? It would just never happen in this part of the world. The only people who would ever suggest that are those who have never read the text in front of us. Jesus told his disciples to find out how much food there was. They did a stock take. What do they find out? Five loaves, two fish. And notice that after Jesus does the miracle, verse 42, they all ate and were satisfied. And when he says all, verse 44, he's talking 5,000 men. They only counted men back then. I have no idea how many women and children ate as well. And there were, verse 43, 12 baskets of leftovers. Jesus clearly, miraculously fed 5,000 people. Did you notice also that when he did that, he gave the crowd a taste of heaven? That is a momentary taste of heaven by reversing the effects of the fall, cancelling out God's curse on humanity for our sin, just for a moment. See, what did we see? We saw 5,000 men eating a meal without having raised a sweat. Come back to Genesis chapter 3. Remember the curse on man. Remember the way that God cursed Adam because of his sin. And to Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Because you listened to her and refused to listen to me. Oh, and by the way, guys, this is not the verse to say you don't have to listen to your wives. Okay, this is Adam refused to listen to God and listen to Eve when she encouraged him to rebel against God. Don't listen to your wife when she encourages you to be sinful. The rest of the time, listen to your wife. What what does he say? Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Every day that we go to work, you and I go to work, and we put in the hard yards and we bust our buns, we do that so that we can eat. And every day that we do that, it is a reminder that we are under God's judgment because of our sin. It was never meant to be like that. And Jesus, with just a word of blessing, reverses God's curse. Jesus, with just a word of blessing, without spending a cent, without raising a sweat, gives 5,000 men a taste of what it will be like to not have to work and be satisfied. It's a taste of life without the curse of sin hanging over our heads. It's a taste of heaven. But that's not all. Because when God cursed Satan in Genesis 3 verse 15, he said, I will put enmity, hostility between you, Satan, and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring, he's going to crush your head and you'll have a go at him. You'll strike his heel. Here in Jesus, we see someone crushing Satan's head, reversing the curse, giving those around him a taste of life without sin's rule, without the impact of sin in their lives. He's giving them a taste of heaven. It's a simple story. Two miracles. But did you notice that it had two feeds? We've definitely got the feeding of the 5,000, but when I read the passage, did you notice the other feed? I'll come back. Jesus and the twelve are exhausted. They head off for some rest and relaxation. Pick it up at verse 33. Now many saw them going and recognised them. And get this. They ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. How would you feel if you were Jesus? How actually do you feel when the phone rings when you're on holidays and you look at the caller ID and it's work? 
death stare. Yeah. But notice verse 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them. Now that word he had compassion on them, it's right, but it just doesn't have the drama of the original word. The original word is the word splachnitsamai. Isn't that just such a lovely word? <laughs> splachnitsamai. Say it with me. Splachnitsamai. You, you kind of sound Russian, but you're not. It's Greek. It's compassion, but it is so much more. It, it means to feel something deep in your gut. It's compassion that's right in here. It's compassion that you see when you see something that is so confronting, you have a visceral, a physical reaction to it. Verse 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he splagnitzamide on them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Just, just think with me for a moment about the crowd. I don't think this is the everyday crowd that Jesus was used to seeing. You know, the crowd that had the sick and the lame and the demon-possessed and the ill as well as everybody else. Did you notice verse 33? They ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of him. These guys are fit. Right, they're keen, and they've made an enormous, spontaneous effort to be with Jesus. Jesus and the disciples, la -di -da -di -da -di -da, they're leisurely sailing across the lake. These guys have run the whole way and beaten the boat. When Jesus looked up, my guess is that he didn't see the normal crowd, but he saw... <sighs> Red faces, tired, sweaty, you know. And let me tell you, these guys are not after lunch. Right? Jesus hasn't done a feeding miracle up until this point. The, the supper, the feeding at the end, was a surprise. These folk are like those at the beginning of chapter 4. They've run all this way because they want to hear from Jesus. They are like sheep without a shepherd. They've run all this way because they are spiritually starving. They've had no one who would feed them from God's word. Look again at verse 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he splacked Nitzamite on them. And what does his compassion drive him to do? When he sees them, how does he respond to their need? He gives them the best feed that they have had in ages. He began to teach them many things. And he taught them till late in the day. And they didn't leave. And there are 5,000 men by the end of the day loving being fed, being fed on his word. Let me ask you a question. Do you run to be fed? Other than the buffet after service. <laughs> Do you have a craving to be fed by Jesus? A craving to be fed by Jesus that at least matches your desire for three meals a day. I missed lunch the other day and let me tell you, by four o'clock, I knew it. I knew that something was missing and I longed for something to eat. Do you crave to be fed by Jesus? If that's not your experience... Can I get you to ask yourself just one question? The question's this. What am I missing? What can't I see that these guys who ran could see? What drove them to run that far so they could hear from Jesus? What have I missed about Jesus that means that I'm just not longing to hang off his every word? Because it's got to be something. What am I missing? Part of the answer might be that you've missed the colour and the command in the story. If you read Mark's Gospel from beginning to end, you'll notice that it's a bit like an old television. 
How many of you, like me, grew up watching black and white television? Okay, you are the old people in the room. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Mark's gospel, in lots of ways, is just black and white. In fact, there are only three colours mentioned in the whole of the gospel. Colour kind of comes up three times. One, purple. The colour of the robe that the soldiers put around Jesus when they are mocking the claim that he is king. The second colour is the colour white. It's the colour of the angels that are around the tomb when Jesus has been raised from the dead. And white comes up again when Peter, James and John go up to the high mountain and they see Jesus transfigured. They see him in all of his glory. And God's voice comes, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Colour is really important to Mark. He doesn't throw it around, so when he mentions it, it matters. I want you to do some work for me now. I want you to have a look at Mark 6, 34 to 39, and I want you to find the colour. When you find it, don't say anything. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, and you're all going to say the colour all at the same time. Start reading. Your time starts now. Have you got it? Okay. One, two, three. Green. It was orange. No, no, it was green. It was green. It was green. Yes, verse 39. Green grass. Why mention it? I mean, it's just green grass. Why, why mention it? One of the things we need to know about Mark is he does not waste a word. His is the shortest of all the Gospels. His style is almost like he's writing in dot points. He's so short. He, he wants us to notice the green grass. But why? Why point this particular feature out? Why here? What colour does verse 34 add to the picture? Jesus sees that they are like sheep without a shepherd. So what does he do? He shepherds his people. He feeds them. He cares for them. He provides for them. What else does he do? Did you notice the colour of verse 39? Not the green, but what Jesus the shepherd, that he commanded them to sit down on the green grass. Is this starting to ring any bells? Does it bring any other Bible passage to mind where a shepherd makes his sheep lie down in green pasture? If I say Psalm, you say 23. How does it go? Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. What does Mark want us to see? He wants us to see that Jesus isn't just the shepherd, but Jesus is the Lord God, the shepherd. Now, when you see up here, L-O-R-D in capitals, that is, that's our Bible's lazy way of writing God's name. In the original language, it's the word Yahweh, which is God's personal name. So this is actually, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mark wants us to see that Jesus is God himself, Yahweh himself, come to his people to shepherd them, to dwell with them, to provide for them, he wants us to look at Jesus as the Lord God in the flesh, speaking a blessing and reversing the curse, his own curse over creation by feeding without a sweat. It's like it was in the Garden of Eden when God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening and they enjoyed God's bountiful provision. God wants us to see, Mark wants us to see that in this scene, in a desolate place beside a lake in Israel, we have a taste of what is to come. It's a taste of heaven when God will dwell with his people, blessing them, shepherding them, feeding them from his word, nourishing them with his food. Now, some of you are thinking, nah, that's really pushing it. Well, if you think that, it may be because you haven't noticed the other reference. 
the reference back to one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament about the shepherds of Israel not feeding the sheep. If you've got a Bible, check it out with me. It's Ezekiel chapter 34. For those of you who can't look it up on the screen, have a look at verse 1. This is a damning indictment that was just as true in Jesus' day as it was when Ezekiel wrote it 600 years earlier. The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel writes. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Speak against all of their religious leaders. Say to them, even to the shepherds of Israel, thus says the Lord. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not the shepherds feed the sheep? What we're going to discover is the shepherds don't feed the sheep. They actually eat the sheep. He says, look, you eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you don't feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. Why did the people run to beat Jesus to the shore? Because as anyone who has read Mark chapters 1 to 5 quickly sees, it's Jesus who's strengthened the weak. It's Jesus who's been healing the sick. He's bound up the injured. He's brought back the strays. He has sought the loss. He has lovingly cared for the people. He's been the shepherd to Israel when they had no shepherd. But there's more. Because what he's done tells us ever so clearly who Jesus is. Flick down to verse 11 and see what God himself promises to do. He says... For thus says the Lord God, behold, I I, I myself, I myself will search for my sheep. I'll seek them out. As a shepherd who seeks out his flock when he's among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all of the places where they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out of the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. What did Jesus do when he fed the 5,000? He self-consciously fulfilled Psalm 23. He self-consciously fulfilled Ezekiel 34. He self-consciously fulfilled God's promises. God himself came. God himself came in the flesh. He dwelt with his people. He shepherded his sheep. He himself made them lie down in green pastures. He himself fed them on the mountains of Israel. God himself came. He himself fulfilled his word. He himself began to roll back the curse of sin. He himself began to roll reverse rather the curse of Genesis 3 and give us a taste of heaven, a taste of life without the fallout from our sin. The feeding of the 5,000, in one sense, it's just a simple story. It's just a simple story that we tell our kids. But if you and I, if we notice the detail, if we see the colour, if we recognise what Mark wants us to see, what we really have here is a taste of heaven. What we have here is an example of God's splagnizomying on us. We see God's heart for his people. We see God's care. We see Jesus giving us a glimpse of the day when he will return. A day when the promises of Revelation 21 are no longer promise, but are actually our reality. You know that day when the dwelling of God is with mankind, when he dwells with us, And we will be his people. And God himself will be our God. And then he splagnizomizes. 
right? He wipes away every tear from our eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things. All the stuff to do with the curse for our sin, gone for good, passed away. The feeding of the 5,000 is a taste of that day to come. And you know what? We can look forward to that day with great confidence. It's not a dream. It's not a forlorn hope. It's not a wish. It is an absolute certainty. When God promised us that Revelation 21 will be ours, we know that he will deliver because we've tasted it, we've seen it already. We know that he'll deliver because he's already fulfilled Ezekiel 34 and Psalm 23. But more than that, we've seen him fulfill all of his promises on a Roman cross. When his son splagnizomite us in a way that we have never been had compassion showered on us before or since. When the God of heaven allowed himself to be put to death so that the curse of sin might be removed once and for all. God keeps his promises. He's given us a taste so that we know that the promise is certain and sure and will be ours. And that's a, that allows us to wait with patience. He's done it all. He will do it all. So let me ask you, do you know personally this certainty? The certainty of heaven. Do you know the certainty of knowing Jesus as he is? God himself come in the flesh to show us the great heart and compassion of God. If you don't, know it deeply in here. If you don't get why those people ran to listen to Jesus because they wanted to hang off his every word, if it's all a bit of a mystery, then do something about it this morning. Tim's going to be down the front. I'm going to be by the lifts over that way. Come and ask us about it. If you've got questions, we'd love to talk with you about it. If you've got doubts, raise them. If you've got objections, let us, let's talk it through. But if you don't get it, you've missed something. We'd love to show you what it is. We'd love you to have a taste now of what God promises in the future. And if you have, if you know that certainty, allow it to shape how you live now. No matter what news you get during the week, allow it to shape your life now. Because the promise is that it's then that the tears will go. The taste is to remind us that we can be certain and know for sure. I'm going to pray. The band's going to come up, and I'll tell you what we'll do next. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we do want to pray that you would help us to so taste what you've promised, taste it in the now, that we long for it in full in the future. Thank you that Jesus came and fed that 5,000. Thank you that you showed us your purposes and your plans and your promises fulfilled in him. Help us to live with his cross, giving us certainty for our future. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.